Well, um, the, the committee has completed the preliminary report on the minimum wage, and the prime minister has also coined livable wage. And some people ask the difference between minimum wage and livable wage. The minimum wage is what we will consider as the minimum pay that an employer will have to pay any employee depending on the category of work. But that may not be enough for somebody to survive. Even though it is the minimum wage, the person may need a little more money in order to live a decent life. And that is where the livable wage will be. And that we have to decide how do we um, augment that minimum wage to make it a livable wage depending on the circumstances of the employee. The, the committee has submitted this report to cabinet and we are deliberating on it and they are also waiting for them to go out in the public domain so you will be given the information as soon as it has left cabinet so you will be able to discuss it in the public domain because the, the minimum wage has serious implication, financial implication, for government as well as the private sector. It is one where once you up the wage, then it means everything else will go up. Even cost of living will go up. Cost of things in the, in the, in the, in the public domain in terms of um, the supermarkets and everything else will go up because the people will argue, well, people are getting a little more money now, so why don't we ask more for our items? However, um, the minimum wage is not a flat wage across the board. It is a wage based on sectors. So farmers will know what is a minimum wage for a farmer, what is a minimum wage for uh, a mason, a carpenter. You know, different categories of workers will have the different um, wage level, which will be worked out by an hourly rate. Uh, X amount of hours per eight hours per day multiplied by how many days for the month will give you what your minimum wage um, should be like. We have received a lot of complaints that persons who work in the service industries, the, the, the wages that they take home is just not capable of supporting them. Um, those in the hotel sector, those who work in the supermarkets and in the dry goods stores, if you hear what they take home at the end of the month, it is not something that can help them survive. But are the employers paying them the right rate? Once they are paying them the right rate and they work it out, it should give them what we call the minimum wage in that sector. Okay, so we are hoping that um, the Prime Minister will, it, it, it will have serious financial implication for government too, because there are people who are working for government who may not be at the minimum wage level and persons who work in the hotels and in the different sectors. So that we hope in the coming months. And I think it would be timely too, because we are also looking at the issue of negotiations for public sector workers. So if all that come together at the time that government is willing to look at the salaries for public sector workers, then we can do the same for everybody across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Minister, you mentioned that um, <coughs> The, that there is an anticipated um, cost increase to goods, services, of course, with a livable wage or minimum wage change. Mm -hmm. The consideration for a livable wage came on the heels of inflation and everything else. With that, doesn't that put us back at square one? Will there be an increase period? Because if it now is, um, okay, the minimum wage has increased to be now at a livable wage, but then the prices of everything continues to grow up, go up. Um, what we can control. Will there be a grace period? Well, you see, that's where price control will come in. Government has to monitor that um, very carefully so that um, business places do not just put up markup on goods because they hear that people are getting a little more money, that now they try to, to take it from them through um, rising cost of living. So that is the responsibility of government to control that. So it is not something that will automatically happen, but it can be one that would tempt some persons to increase cost of things, knowing that, especially when we government has a, an increase for public servants. People in the private sector and in the public domain want to increase prices, I think, because they feel that government employees are getting more money now, so why not 
up the price for my, what you call the loo patat and your this and your banana. But it is not right because that there was no additional cost to produce these goods. So why should you increase the cost? So price control has to step up on that. Take one. Mm -hmm. Um, well, again, it is left to government will enforce. Once we put on a, a minimum wage, government will enforce it. However, it is left. There are people who work below the minimum wage, but it is at their own will. Government cannot tell you not to work for less money if you want to. But if you come and complain that they are not paying you the right wage, it is government's responsibility to ensure that you are paid the, the minimum wage that you are supposed to get. But some people agree to work for an employer less than the minimum wage. So it means once you agree, then you do not have a grievance. You cannot come and complain because you agreed to work for less money. But these the persons who did not agree to work for less money, and we find that the employers could pay them a little more, then we have to ensure that they pay them. And uh, livable wage uh, or minimum wage is not something that we come up with out of the blues for St. Lucia. It is compared with what happens regionally and how do they arrive at their minimum wage in the different islands in the Caribbean. You know, I'm happy when that, that wrote, Madam Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it speak to about the government finally ushering St. Lucia in a time, in an era where uh, St. Lucia will be able to, and salary people will, will be able to get competitive salaries uh, that will be able to or should be able to uh, help them, you know, support their lifestyles, their families? You are a member of a cabinet that is about to introduce that to St. Lucia for the first time. Yes, I think um, it is a positive sign. And having worked and de deal with the trade union movement for decades, um, when we used to compare salaries of teachers in St. Lucia and the other islands in the Caribbean, St. Lucia was doing very well. So we knew when we compare regionally. So the same way in St. Lucia, if we come up with a livable wage for the St. Lucian public, we can compare with what's happening in the other islands and we can speak um, to it that we are not treated, we are not treating our um, employees here unfairly. So it would be a positive sign for the government to say that we are a par with other Caribbean islands or even better off than some of them. Mm -hmm. Certainly the report included consultation with the tr uh, labor unions and of course private sector representatives. This, this is not an autocratic report and say, hey, take it, shove it down your throat, no. Okay, well, what the committee did, the committee actually went through a very scientific way of arriving at a minimum wage, and they actually used the International Labor Organization's standards to arrive at what should be a minimum wage for somebody living in St. Lucia. Now, some people may not like the recommendation, so right now this pre pre preliminary report is now going into the public domain. So that is where we are engaging now. It is not the final report yet. It's going in the public domain where you will have copies of it. You will criticize, you will comment. The employers will do the same thing and the employees will complain or they'll talk, you know, until we arrive at what is acceptable. So it is not the final report yet to say this is it and nothing more. But it is promising that people will get a, a, a better wage than what some of them, especially those in the lower bracket. Last question. How, how accepting do you think the business um, community will be of this, considering in the past few years um, their operating costs and such have gone up, as, whether it's inflation or taxes mm. or whatever, their, their operating costs have gone up. So how welcoming do you think the business community may be to that arrangement at this point? Well, I don't want to read the minds of any business owner. But a business is one that is set up to generate profit. And once you come up with a minimum wage that will erode some of that profit, I don't expect any business owner to smile and say it's a very good idea. However, what is important is to ensure that the employees give the employers a, 
a fair day's work for the salary that they will that they will pay them. We do not want to fight to give people a, a more decent wage and then they try to rob the employer by cutting their performance short, not reporting on time, not giving quality work and everything else. So this is something that we may have a little challenge with. But no employer who has to find more money to pay the employees will be smiling about that. I don't expect them to smile. But the fact remains that government will want the St. Lucian public to have a more decent way of living. And if they are giving the employer a fair day's work, they have to get a fair day's pay for the work that they do. Since you mentioned Marcus Cole, what were the efforts in your constituency like in terms of new spare heading or what? What trust did you guys have to ensure that you know students are ready to go back to the classroom today? Well, um, today, to be quite honest, I'm very excited because I had in excess of 240 children come to my office for assistance, for back to school assistance. And I can say proudly that not one child was um, or missed the opportunity to benefit from the back to school program. So every child who came into my <coughs> office, every single one of them were able to get some sort of assistance, especially with their books, the book component. Um, every child was able to benefit. Also, quite a few children who made it to SAF uh, um, were also able to get some support from my office. Some students, in certain instances, were able to apply to SAF, uh, um, notwithstanding the fact that they know very well that their parents were not in a position to be able to afford it. We were able to get them the guarantee that once they're able to make it, once they're accepted, that we were going. I was going to see, as their parliamentary, I'd make it my business to see to it that they got the tuition paid. And, um, I can tell you about nine or ten students from my community who on a normal day would not be able to attend SAFA given their current family circumstances, the financial circumstances of their family. Today they're going to school and they're going to school proudly and I can assure you that they're not just going to school proudly this semester. We're going to provide them with the necessary support throughout the rest of their um, tenure at SAFA, Louis or at POSEC to make sure that they too can be, they can benefit as other students would notwithstanding their background. Okay. Um, just, I guess, one last question. Um, last last month at the, I think it was the two-year rally, you had made some announcements for your um, constituency, like the expansion of the cemetery and uh, some other things that you had in place. I know the jetty. Um, are there any sort of updates on that as yet? Or yeah, definitely. Um, at the two-year anniversary, I announced that we were going to put lights on the past year's playing field. Um, that has actually started. The construction has already started. Um, the implementation of this is already. We are expecting to finish that project before end of October. As I also mentioned, the when playing field, I'm happy that the Minister of Sports asked, "When am I ending my cricket competition?" Which is which made me very anxious as to why do you want to know. And then he said, "He needs to know when I'm ending, so he too can mobilize his team, so we can start the work on the when playing field." The expansion of the Monipo Cemetery. Also, that is also a very interesting project, given what it means to the people of Miku North. Quite a few of our people after the past have to be buried at Deriso or um, Viewfort, and that is not something that sits very well with the community. However, the Minister of Local Government and his team were down there with me about two weeks, um, two weeks ago, and we engaged persons living within close proximity. We have already acquired the lands. That process is completed, and there are funds in the budget. So Minister for Local Government has given me the assurance that we're going to mobilize equipment and start in a phased process. We're not going to complete it overnight, but we're going to start with a phase, in a phase process so that persons can now be buried in Monrepo once again. So quite the jetty, um, <laughs> I'm happy to be able to mention that the jetty, plans for the jetty are, I want to say well on the way. We're almost in, in, in the stage where um, we can actually see work happening on the ground. I mean, you know that there are some administrative things that you have to deal with before you actually get to that process. You have to get this year approval, quite a few things that have to happen. Um, we've been actively working towards these things and we're well on the way. I can I foresee that when Christmas comes, I may spend my Christmas on the jetty. So with that, I can say a lot of things are happening in Mikunov. We are no longer acting the confirmation of the post of the Commissioner of Police in the person of Ms. Christina Escapulius. Well, sure. Okay. Well, I'm very pleased that Ms. Paulius has accepted to be, to be the new Commissioner of Police. She's actually on a one-year contract, and we need to have, uh, in the force, there was literally no succession planning. 
We have a core of young officers, young officers who are very capable, but we needed some time so that they could get the necessary training, they could get the required training and the experience. So Miss Polius is there for one year, so, she, so there can be a smooth transition into new leadership in the, in the force. So she's there for one year, and after this year, the force is going to be on the new, younger leadership. But we, need, we needed that training, that period of transition for training, etc. Yes, Jerry, so, you're jumping from the <laughs> jumping. So, so, you have, Mr. Um, Philip, point, point Mr. Philip, I just said so. Mr. Philip was acting commissioner. And I just said that Ms. Pelius is the new commissioner for one year to, to allow us time to usher new leadership into the... Yes, go ahead. Was Mr. Um, Philip, um, because we know there have been a lot of... Mr. Money. Philip that did a sterling job as acting commissioner of police. Mr. Philip was responsible. I, I noticed you, you no longer complain about passports again. That's happening. That, that is happening at, 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 a much, at a much quicker pace. You may know that we're going to be moving into, new, into a new building for, for the passport office. That, that, that is happening. So, you know, you, you, you'll also know that during the, the, the Suppression of Crime Act, Mr. Philip was the one responsible for the majority of, 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 of ensuring that that act came into being. But, as I said, we thought that there was need for more training, there was need to usher new leadership. So, Ms. Pelius is there for one year, so that that new leadership, that new leadership can be can come to the place. Okay, yes, the, the leadership training is for um, do, well, if you can like who are the participants? All, you know, all senior officers, everybody, all senior all senior officers. Well, in right, fact, right, we right. are going to have. In fact, we've written some friendly governments to, for, for for leadership because you know in 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 the force there was actually, you know um, something you must remember. The, the training vote was zero. We, we seem to have forgotten that, that the training vote for the police force was zero, nothing, not a cent. You also know that maintenance for police stations, the, the police stations were maintained by dinners and lunches. You also know that the view for the, the, the view for police station, the roof was in a complete mess. If that roof had been fixed, it would have cost three hundred thousand dollars. We have to spend nearly three million. You also know that the grocery police station was in a complete mess, complete, and there were plans already in 2016 to construct new grocery police head, new grocery police headquarters. That was bad. You understand? You'll also know that we have bought nearly thirty vehicles in the last two years. You also know that right now we are recruiting more than 70 new police officers. You understand? So it, it's a work in progress. The, the problem of crime and crime suppression in St. Lucia did not start in July 26. It didn't start that. It's been a recurring problem. So it's a recurring problem. But what I will never say, and no matter how you prompt me to say it, I will not say, this person can't, but I can. I don't know if you, if you recall these words, Kenny can't, but I can. I will never say that. What I will say is I will give resources, because, you know, there are many people. In fact, the former prime minister promised to solve crime. He said, Kenny can't, but I can, or I will. I will never say that. I think the former prime minister tried. As all prime ministers, no prime minister wants a country with crime. No prime minister. And I will say that he tried. Of course he tried. Kenny Anthony tried. Every prime minister. Why should a prime minister want crime in this country? Let's be logical about it. Why should a prime minister want to administer a country where there is rampant crime? But what I will never say is that Shastri could not, but I can.
I'll never say that. What I will say, I'll give the police the resources, we'll put the policies in place, we'll try the best to give them the resources that they need to help in the fight against crime. Um, two questions for me. One, you did mention that um, with, um, at the end of the, the one year tenure of um, Ms. Descartes, that we would see a younger, younger leadership. Um, is it very possible that Mr. Philip could, could... I never have a crystal ball. <laughs> I'm not even sure what, what will happen in a few seconds. I can't say that. Okay, the UWP made some recommendations last year, December, and I think they said they submitted it again to you. Um, they're calling on you to, I guess... When, when, when the UWP wants to make recommendations to me, they'll make them in the proper way, They'll make them with a view for discussion. I have asked, in fact, when I call for support, I'm ridiculed. So the UWP suggestions suggest are not in good faith. My opinion is that the UWP wants a country to be in chaos. My opinion is that the UWP wishes bad. I believe that every morning when the UWP wake up, they want to be wrong to have the same Lucia. That's my belief. That's my utter belief. Because you can't have a country where an opposition party is actually glorifying crime, actually hoping that there are hundred murders in the country, actually hoping and praying for it, actually looking to say that killing St. Vincent is because of St. Lucia. Highly irresponsible. The United Workers Party, what they are trying to do, they are trying to create Chaos, disorder, disunity, confusion in this country because they have lost elections. The government will remain focused. The government, will, the government will do what we have to do. We're going to be focused. And again, I'm making the plea. I'm asking everyone, churches, civil society, let us get together to deal with the crime problems in this country. Let's get together. But... I, am, I, I, am, I don't believe that an opposition party should deliberately spread chaos and misinformation only because they believe it will assist in the quest for power. The people of Sinusha have taken a decision, and this government is going to be a government for everyone. Everyone. We've just spent nearly $8 million in education support for the students of this country. We've given every child a laptop. Every child, in spite of political affiliation, got to get a laptop. The opposition parliamentarians were given educational support for their constituencies, and they were given stimulus support. The, the opposition parliamentarians, the, the, the two of them, I was in opposition for six years. I never got any support. This government is doing it for everyone. So the opposition politicians. They got support to buy things for school, and they also got duty-free concessions. The opposition, so that they, they could import school supplies for the constituents. So we believe that this country belongs to all of us. We believe this country can't be divided by selfish political motives. And while we are in government, we're going to be focused on developing this country for the benefit of all. This morning, school has reopened. 26,000 students are going to school. These students, we wish them the best. The government is making all in its power. The teachers, every teacher was given $600 more as material allowance. Every teacher. The teachers who were, who were temporary, they will be getting paid in September. We've increased it from $800 to $1,400. We never said we give it to some teachers. Every teacher got it. We increased it. Is it something that we initiated by the Labour Party when we were in government? We've increased it this year, every teacher. Schools, schools, we understand that there is need for 
general repairs in all the schools. Within our, within our fiscal constraints, we've tried to repair as many as possible. But that is work in progress. In fact, I am seeking some funding so that we can do major repairs in the schools that need it. We understand that the conditions in the schools are not perfect. And I'm thanking the, the, the teachers and the students for bearing the first. But there must be some responsibility. We can't continue to vandalize school furniture. We can't continue to, to, to vandalize the, 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 the school equipment. But, I'm, but I, I, I'm, I can assure you that we are trying our best. We are trying our best to ensure that schools are repaired. But it's holistic. Every child got $500 when they pass the, to go into secondary school. Every child. Every child got a laptop computer. Every teacher got the increase in their material allowances. And every school, regardless of the constituency, in terms of priority, there was repairs in every school. Further, we have a one university graduate. We have, the government has a policy that will try to get every household to have one student going to a university. Because I'm sure you know about students who are very capable, but because their parents could not afford it, because their parents or they could not get a scholarship because the limited, limited number of scholarships, they could not go to university. We have something called the first generation scholarships, where households where children, households of where children, neither their parents or their grandparents ever went to a, a, to a, 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 a university, they will be going now. We will try to get them now. We've done a hundred of them. Don't get me wrong. Everyone can't get it at one time, but it's a work in progress. We also have never before had so many solutions going out to study at university. And further, we have a grant program which is going to be administered by, by a separate board to give financial support to students to get university education. Not everybody. Everybody can't get it one time. Everybody never got it one time. And further, for those students who are not, it's a word I don't like to use, academically qualified, I don't like to use that word at all, they're going to, they, we, are, we are expanding TVET, technical vocation and, and, and education, so these students can get, can learn skills that they want to learn. So many things are happening in education. Many things are happening. So I just hope that the students make use of the opportunities that are available to them. And I want to thank the teachers for their dedication to the cause of educating the people of this country. Mr. Prime Minister, next week, um, CARICOM will be meeting. Um, we'll be having a CARICOM meeting. One of the issues is Haiti. Um, will St. Lucia be sending any translation translators to Haiti? No. Well, I, there is, we have been asked to do that. Um, I've discussed it with my cabinet. As you know, Dr. Kenny Anthony is part of a, a group of wise men who are right now in Haiti, who are doing some work to see they can work with the, with, with the different groups in Haiti, but it's a decision that I have not taken. But the solution we're monitoring the situation is concerned. We, we continue to monitor, and, but we're working with CARICOM as far as this, this is concerned. We are taking the CARICOM position, we're working with CARICOM. And I suppose climate change too will be on the agenda and what's happening. Yeah, in fact, there is a meeting at the end of September in, in, in Grenada on climate change. And, and I've, I've said to you, to you before, every time I get up, I listen to the weather forecast. This is one of my biggest concerns. That is one of my biggest concerns. The threat of a major hurricane hit, hitting hitting our region, particularly St. Lucia. It's one of my biggest concerns. This, I lose sleep over that. Something we have no control over, but something that is reality because of climate change. This is one of my biggest concerns. Okay. Um, earlier in your, I guess, response to the crime situation in relation to the opposition, you said that you don't think that they're using the best means of, I guess, um, Putting forward their recommendations. So, what would be? The I don't know what the, I don't know the recommendations. You know, honestly, I read it and I didn't see the recommendations. I saw statements. 
I didn't see recommendations. I didn't see, this, let's do this and that will happen. I saw, state, I saw bland statements, like statements, statements. In the opposition, is, is, I'll tell you something. The opposition ridicules me when I ask to come and speak. When I say, let us, stand, let us sit together to work on it, they ridicule me. They try to. I mean, I, I can't be ridiculed, but they ridicule me. You see, I'll tell you something. I have to be so careful what I say. Do you know I can't say the word tall or short? I can't say these words. I mean, this is, this, this is really rough on me. I cannot say tall. I can't say it. If I say it, it's a whole story. I mean, this is, I mean, this is so unfair. But I will never tell any of you. I will never tell that you're against me or you don't support me. Or the, I'll invite the entire public to listen to all the press. I will never see that I will never single out any of you to tell people don't listen to your offer. I'll never do that. I'm a, I am from a whole era of free press. I'm from an era where people, I lived the time, you see, you young journalists, I lived the time when radio stations were closed. It wasn't the Labour Party. I've, I've lived a time when radio stations were closed by governments. You know, the history, you know, there are some people in St. Lucia who know the history very well, you know, but they very conveniently forget it and use it at some point when they want to, you, you, you understand? I will never make these statements. I will never tell you that a level the public don't listen to you. A level the public judge for themselves what they must listen to. No, will I ever call you a hyena if, if you laugh. I'll never do that. But you know, there, there, there is one rule for me and one rule for somebody else. I will never say the things that, 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 that I hear. I will never blanketly, blanket call people corrupt. And I, I won't do that. You understand? But nor will I ever, ever engage. And no one can, you know, Sometimes I laugh because when people accuse me of things, I tell them, play the tip. Like the $1,500 they accuse me of saying, no one can produce a tip to see why I said so. <laughs> you know, like when they say I'm against investment, nobody can ever hear Philip Joseph Pierre in any platform, political platform, parliament, or any speech ever criticize foreign investment. Never. The most investment in this country came when I was Minister of Investment under the Kenyan Anthony government. There is no one who can produce any tip that can ever see I ever criticize foreign investment or I ever made any racial statement. No one. The only statement I make is myself. I say what I look like and I say who I am. So all these Produce a tip. Produce it. I can produce tips. I can produce tips of medicants and barking dogs. I can produce these tips. I can produce them. I can produce these tips of massa. I can produce these tips. But produce mine. Bring challenge. Anything I am accused of. Bring the tips that say what they say I said. I have never, I have said to the whole world that I was born with a disability. You know that. I've said to the whole world. I've said so to the whole world. I've said to the whole world that I stutter. I've said to the whole world, I'm, I'm not ashamed of that. I have nothing to be ashamed of. God has been good to me. And the people of Cassius East have been good to me, and the people, people of the Labour Party have, have been good to me. So I'm not, I have nothing to be ashamed of. I know that this job is temporary, and at some time it's going to end. And I live that every day. So I'm very pleased with the Labour Party, with the government, and how we are promoting St. Lucia. Okay, may, also um, please, hold on. may also please, Mr. Prime Minister, youth economy just doled out a, a million dollars. Yes. Brands. How well is uh, your youth economy agency performing? Again, you see, again, that's another story. 
The youth economy is a success story that everyone, everyone seems to have forgotten. This is the first government. I don't know if you recall when we spoke about the youth economy. Remember what the opposition was saying? Do you remember what, the, and then again, you can quote it. These are quotes. When we decided we're going to come, the UFI community now has doled out a million dollars in grants, not even loans as yet. And the Caribbean Development Bank has injected, will inject, in the process of injecting over 14 million dollars, 16 million dollars of loans and grants into the youth economy. And absolutely no politics. In fact, I get criticized for not being more involved in the youth economy. And I dare, I just let, 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 let people handle absolutely no politics. You saw who got the grants. I never knew that, nor will I ever oppose it. Because I believe that there are certain things where the people of the country must benefit. Sports, education, economic empowerment can have no political colors. Yes, last, you see. I was asking about, um, you mentioned Cashew's East, and I think over the weekend you're supposed to have the um, your 15th annual academic um, honoring ceremony. Um, That's great. Um, so what was, I guess, what were the outcomes of that? Um, how do you feel, uh, I mean, for the 15th time? I invited you, I thought you to come, but you, 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 you didn't come. I, I expected this, you know, I expected the press to, to attend. I mean, I, I invited the press. You, it, was, it, 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 it was wonderful. Six young people. Um, they, they, they answered, they, they were free rounds of questions. It's the fifteenth time I've done that. The prices were um, the prices were a laptop computer for the for the student who wins and a, a, and a monetary prize and a bag full of school supplies. And every child who topped the class in the common entrance examination, it, 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 I think there's a new word for it now, they got a, they got school supplies and they also got a tablet. So the prices were, were good. And then there was a motivational speaker, some young lawyer, a, a young lawyer, I'm, his name is Peter Marshall, spoke to the people and then it was very, 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 very interesting. The young people enjoyed themselves. Again, there is absolutely no political color. The students are not chosen by me. They're chosen by the school. And you see the difference between me. I will never go on Facebook. And you, you, you know in my constituency, I gave out tons of exercise books and school bags. And, but I, I wouldn't... I, I, that, that, that will not be on Facebook. I've done that for so many years. And the people of St. Lucia understand that. The people of my constituency understand that. So they, they know that their parliamentary rep will never go on Facebook and see what he did for them. They, they, they reward me by giving me 2,000 votes majority and things. That's how they, <laughs> that's how they reward me. So I don't have to do these kind of things. Mr. Marisa, yes. on that same, um, with, with um, your quiz, yes. you made a statement stating that Agents are divided and yes. Does that mean the, are you about the, the yes. Yes, I am. Why is it that? Because they are dividing the country by by misinformation, by going abroad with misinformation, by saying things that are completely not true, by trying their best to stop the good name of Saint Lucia by trying their best to make investors get disinterested in this country, and I am putting it, and if you look at the utterances, I make no apologies for it. If you look at the utterances, if you look at what they say at the town hall meetings, you will see a straight division, divisiveness, all because they want to halt the progress of this country, and I make no apologies for saying that. I understand criticism. I've been involved in opposition politics. I know opposition politicians want to get back into government. But you get back into government by a process. 
You can find government by giving ideas, not by blatant lies and, and, and things that are obviously not true. No proof. And what they do? They move from one lie to another. So they say something, <clears throat> it wasn't true, they drop it. I'll tell you something. Look at the accusations that the opposition has made on this government. And that husband, have you heard them ever come back and say that's, that, that's not true? Just say a lie, drop it. Say a, a, give some misinformation and drop it. And, and the sad thing is that people do not want the government to defend itself. People get annoyed when the government defends itself. We can't allow people to just say things that are obviously not accurate and can be proven not to be accurate. They're not true. I'm not just saying, and, and I ask, bring the proof. But what the opposition does is that they try to spread discontent. They try to spread disunity. All because they want to hold the progress of the, of the people of this country. Because they've lost the elections. I understand criticism. I, I was in opposition. I understand it. And I welcome criticism. But do it not with, 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 with things that are obviously misinformation. So I stand by, 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 by my statement and I make no apologies for it. I think the opposition is trying to destroy St. Lucia because they've lost elections. And I make no apologies for it. And then I'm not seeing all the members. I'm not seeing all the UDAP supporters. I'm seeing the leadership of the United States Party, the leadership. Because I'm sure that there are UDAP supporters who want to see St. Lucia progress. But the leadership of the United States Party, they are the ones who are, who are trying to create mayhem and destruction in this country because they've lost elections. And I make no apologies for saying that. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you.